I put the title on this, Ecological Socialism versus Capitalist Exterminism. And I'll talk about two senses of exterminism. It's a term that came out of the uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament from E.P. Thompson. Um, what I want to do, because we only have an hour, is lay out some propositions without elaborating too much. And uh, then we can have a discussion about them. And the first set are about what's wrong with capitalism from our point of view as Greens, and then how socialism, particularly ecological socialism, can provide solutions. So I'm going to go through 10 things that I think we need to think about capitalism as being wrong, and they're systemic. The, the one that is most prominent historically is exploitation, theft of our labor that's institutionalized. It's unjust. So we produce and there's the fruit of that labor, but then the capitalists take a portion of it. And there are two classic ways of uh, explaining that. One's the labor theory of value, which uh, Marx, that's what people think of, but it really comes through all the classical uh, <coughs> economists, Adam Smith, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, those people. And <clears throat> the basic idea is that the value created uh, isn't appropriated by the people that create it. They get a part of it as wages and the rest is appropriated by the people that own the tools, the means of production that the people are working with. And it's controversial whether that actually explains the prices. And if you want to find a recent uh, argument that it is, you should look up uh, two m guys from England, Cockshot and Cockrell who have sort of done an empirical analysis of where we are right now. And their basic <coughs> analysis is in the industrial economies, the workers are getting about half of what they produce and the rest is appropriated by the capitalists. Um, there's another critique that sort of a different tradition and that's the labor theory of property. And this starts with Proudhon, you know, the French anarchist. Um, and I think it's been best explained recently by David Ellerman. And if you look up his writings, the basic idea there is forget about prices and value. Just think of it in terms of property rights. If you are producing something and the classic definition of property or the right to property is it's the fruit of your labor, you're entitled to dispose of it as you want, but somebody else is getting it. So you can critique exploitation from either of those bases. Um, and this is a problem that the classical economists considered central. I mean, their whole thing from from Smith right up to Marx was how do you get rid of unearned income and they were going after the landlords and the money lenders and uh, when we get to the end of these ten propositions about capitalism we'll find out we still got that problem. Um, a second one that became really important for lefties in the 60s was alienation which Marx talked about a lot in his uh, younger writings and the basic idea there is we produce products and put them into an economic system that then comes back upon us as if, and, and we have no control over it. So the whole system's alienated, our labor's alienated, and the process of disalienating that is uh, a problem of creating a really free society. <coughs> so that has to do with freedom. Capitalism is an unfree society for people that work. Uh, a third thing that's also been big, particularly for the traditional left, are periodic crises, business cycles, boom and bust, scarcity and gluts, and because the system is unplanned and uh, unpredictable, it creates economic insecurity, particularly for people at the bottom of the economic hierarchy. So that's a third problem with capitalism. Um, that leads, particularly if you read more recent analyses in the uh, tradition of monopoly capitalism, Paul Sweezy, and Paul Barron wrote this book in the mid-60s, which had a lot of influence on the left at that time, and has been carried forward by these people at Monthly Review. Um, and that is stagnation. And the basic argument there is capitalism has been able to grow when it needed to build out a technological complex. You know, railroads and the steam engine at one time, uh, the first wave of suburbanization with the automobile, the post-war expansion of suburbanization and consumer goods. The problem is once you build that out, the capitalists run out of profitable outlets for tangible investment and the economy stagnates. And uh, where that leads to is financialization, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so periodic crises and stagnation 
or problems that are intrinsic to the way the system operates. Uh, another problem is inequality. That, that starts with the exploitation and it, you create class polarization and that integrates with other forms of oppression like racism, which if you look at it historically, there had been ethnic prejudice against groups against each other and rivalries, <laughs> but under capitalism, it becomes profitable to dominate one group to the exclusion of others. And if you look at the history of slavery in the United States, you, you see African slaves, European indentured servants having similar status till you get to Bacon's Rebellion when the slaves and the indentured servants got together and rebelled against the elite. It wasn't all you know, a good thing because they were also trying to take land from the Indians. But the elites realized that the poor whites and the poor blacks could take their power. And that's when they started making racism systematic and institutionalized. And all that flows from a system that generates inequality. So another thing, you've got competition between companies in the market and also states where the states promote, support their companies, and that generates war and militarism. And if you look at the history of capitalism, particularly in the 20th century, the most uh, warlike century in human history with the most deaths, the most wars, the most weapons, uh, you can see how that's developed historically. And that's where the first sense of using the word exterminism for capitalism comes in. E.P. Thompson, who was one of the people that uh, sort of founded the New Left in the 50s in, in Britain, a famous historian, uh, when we were in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, which here sort of manifests most broadly as the freeze movement in the 80s, um, that was at a time when the missile crisis in uh, Germany, one of the big issues that got the German Greens going, was at its highlight. So there's this famous article, Notes on Exterminism, The Last Stage of Civilization by uh, Edward Thompson. And it starts out, comrades, we need a cogent theoretical and class analysis of the present war crisis. Yes, but to structure an analysis in, an analysis in a consecutive rational manner may be at the same time to impose a consequential rationality upon the object of analysis. What if the object is irrational? What if events are willed by no single causative historical logic, but are simply the product of a messy inertia? What if a collection of fragmented forces, political and military formations, ideological <coughs> imperatives, weapons technologies, are what's driving the situation, like World War I? You know, one assassination and suddenly all these secret alliances manifest themselves and we've got a world war. The point is, you can look at the logic of capitalism and see how it generates war and militarism, but then you get things that are thrust up by that, like we had during the Cold War, two military, militarized oligarchies competing, and the nukes on a hairline trigger, anything could set it off. We're really still in that situation. Uh, it's just not as uh, prominent. So this system generates irrationalities, and then irrationality can take over, and it, it's not like you can go from A to B to C and end up with nuclear war, but you've created the conditions when something could spark it off. So. War and militarism is a real serious problem with capitalism. And then this is what's been called the second contradiction of capitalism uh, by James O'Connor, who began to talk about the first contradiction between socialized cooperative production and privatized appropriation, exploitation, and the things that follow from that. The second contradiction is capitalism depends on growth. The logic for every corporation is grow or die. It built into the system is endless growth. And that's incompatible with a steady state sustainable economy that uh, lives off the income from the environment, the environmental services the environment generates. What we have is a system that's basically eating up the capital, the principal. And that creates, so that's why capitalism is incompatible with an ecological sustainable society. And another thing that happens there is the externalization of costs, which is in the interest of every firm. Uh, that's both onto nature and society at large. Pollution, various forms of ecological destruction, the market and the price system doesn't measure that. Uh, it might be a, a bad impact down the road in time and they're only looking at current costs. Plus, it's in their interest to, uh, as much as possible, not internalize those costs in the firm but externalize them onto society and nature. And then they also use uh, their power to get favors from the state to privatize costs and socialize 
uh, I'm sorry, to privatize, socialize the risk and privatize the profits. And so that's the way they basically take the surplus for themselves and leave the cost with the rest of us. <coughs> so number nine is monopoly capital. One of the other things that flow from this system of competition and trying to get bigger in order to compete is concentration and centralization of capital. And what happens then is you don't have competition between firms by price, which is the classical model you get in Economics 101, because the prices are set by the leading firm in the oligopolistic market. And most of the world economy is that kind of economy. It's not competitive. Um, if you look at, uh, this is monthly review, folks who followed this, they've just, this is the second, this is the current issue, or next to the current issue, on the internationalization of monopoly capital, they had a previous article about just the extent of it, and that's going to be a book they're coming out, kind of updating the monopoly capital analysis. And they, they provide the empirical numbers on how monopolized the economy is, and it, it's monopolized in ways we don't think about, like outsourcing by big corporations to firms in various parts of the world. They're not formally owned, but they're controlled. You know, Walmart basically tells people, go to China and produce where it's cheaper, or we're not going to buy from you because we want lower costs. And so that means they're not competing by price. They're competing by product differentiation, Coke and Pepsi, advertising, and also by favors they can get from the state. You know, for example, I'm UPS, <coughs> Teamster, FedEx, got a favorite uh, labor law passed. So for them to organize, they got to have the whole country vote in one organizing election rather than hub by hub which the rest of the transportation industry does because they got regulated as an airline even though they're a brick and mortar you know, truck thing mostly. And uh, so that's how FedEx got a special favor from the state and that's how they're competing with UPS. The other thing that happens is that you get these vested interests because they're so big and powerful they can get what they want from the state. So, you know, full employment, everybody says they're for full employment, but these capitalists really don't want that because they want us to be insecure and willing to accept less wages. So while you can draw a mathematical model of how you could get full employment in a, a, a private capitalist economy, they're going to lobby against that because it's against their interests. You can figure out the same thing with fossil fuels. You know, you can, you know, with a carbon tax and other things, figure out how you could get to green energy in a capitalist economy, but the problem is you've got these vested interests that screw up any model that you might draw up. Um, another thing is the medical industrial complex where they have a vested interest in keeping this totally irrational system we have and use their lobbying power to get it. So th those are ways in which, you know, you, you hear the, and it's in the news and the cable talk shows all the time about, you know, capitalism and competition gets you to lower prices and, you know, there's freedom to enter but we're not in that kind of a system anymore. It's a monopolized system. And what it's become is, and this is what, you know, this new book on the updating of monopoly capital, it's, they call it monopoly finance capital. What happens when you have stagnation and they're not profitable outlets and tangible investment is they start speculating it, in financial uh, instruments. So, you know, instead of taking all the subsidies we've given them in these bailouts recently, and investing in new means of production to employ people and produce goods and services, they're using that for commodity plays, stock plays, bond plays, currency plays. And what they're doing is just rearranging who owns the assets we've already got rather than creating new assets. And that has become to such an extent an important trend in, in the economy that corporate profits have increased from single digits in the financial sector back in the 1970s to over 40% since 2000. And so this financial economy, you know, it creates asset bubbles and bursts uh, and busts. Um, and so all the stimulus we've had, uh, a lot of it's just gone into the cash reserves of these corporations and banks who are using it to concentrate further their ownership <coughs> of what we already got. So there's one and a half trillion dollars in, in lendable reserves in the banks. There's two trillion in the corporations. And then the wealthy, the individuals, the households have 13 trillion. And they're not investing in, in new production. To the extent they are, to the extent, you know, the uh, tax breaks for working class people, you know, like our little uh, payroll tax deduction we're getting right now, is being spent on goods because of the trade agreements, you know, it's stimulating China rather than the United States. So these are a lot of the problems that we get with uh, 
under monop monopoly finance capital where we are right now. And one of the ironies of this is that, you know, I've mentioned the classical economists were trying to get rid of unearned income. I mean, Marx really thought the industrial capitalists would, would rein in the uh, financial capitalists and then would, that would be how resources or uh, investment would be allocated to expanding industrial production. You know, everybody focuses on volume one, which is about exploitation, but volume two and especially volume three were about the financial sector and, you know, how eventually the capitalists would take over. And that turned out not to be a right prediction, at least to this point, because finance capital has taken back over the whole domination of the economy. So there you've had 10 propositions about what's wrong with capitalism and why Greens, as Greens, we should oppose it. So let's talk briefly about alternatives. And uh, so what is socialism? You know, the, the popular sense is if it's government, it's socialist. If it's private, it's capitalist. And I heard this on uh, uh, MSNBC one time. You had Pat Buchanan from the right, Chris Matthews, who's sort of a liberal Democrat, and Lawrence O'Donnell's a liberal Democrat. And they all agreed that Bismarck was the original socialist because he introduced the Social Security system and unemployment insurance and whatnot. And uh, so for them, socialism is social insurance, you know, a government program. But, you know, historically, socialism was economic democracy through social ownership. Ownership has two rights, the right to dispose of the surplus that's created and the right to make decisions, management decisions about what gets produced, how it's produced, and so forth. And without that democracy, you don't have socialism, you just have a government program. I mean, Bismarck, if you go read Marx and Engels about, you know, because even then some people were saying, oh, he's, he's moving us towards socialism. I mean, they, they made so much fun of that. It's, it, there, it was, it, it's really a, a biting critique. So part of the problem, if you raise the word socialism, people think government versus private. And that's not what it was really about historically. What it really means is worker and community control. And that's not necessarily the state versus the market. That could be a co-op. You know, a co-op in a worker co-op, you get uh, your share of the surplus generated according to how much labor you contribute. If it's a consumer co-op, the idea is it operates at cost and you get rebated any surplus in proportion to the purchases you make. So there's no exploitation going on there. You can, you can find in capital, you know, Mark said that's half the problem, you know how to dispose of the surplus. But then he said there were problems if they're competing in a market because then you generate some of the dynamics we've been talking about that issue from competition. Um, and I just want to point out over here, this is in terms of economic democracy, one idea w you can think about. Um, and after you know, we talk, you can come up and read about this more, but you know, I'll just point out here, you've got the communities basically deciding what they need and the industries deciding how they can produce it and you have a coordinating body to, to work out a plan to do that. And that, you know, is one of the classic uh, models of uh, bottom-up de democratic socialism that has been put forward. Um, and historically, socialism as a movement is focused on exploitation and economic security. And one of the, th the ways it got somewhat off track, I believe, is that it, it it tended to get into the state versus private uh, difference. So uh, they often set up bureaucratic forms of state ownership and programs like Social Security or nationalized industries that really didn't have worker and community control. And, and then you get a state elite that operates them in their own interests. That's been a problem with historical socialism. At the same time, throughout the history of socialism, there's been an ecological undercurrent. You can find in their books, there are whole books about this. There's a book called Marx's Ecology, where they recognize that uh, nature was the underlying basis of uh, the economy. And that, you know, what socialism was doing was not only harmonizing human with human, but humanity with nature. And they talk about problems of soil erosion and, and, and resource destruction. Um, back in the 19th century, probably the most prominent ecological socialist was William Morris who also dealt with the problem of alienation. And he envisioned, like people like Kropotkin <coughs> did and others, a uh, socialist society where it was uh, humanly scaled. A lot of the production was local, making it more amenable to democratic control. And in uh, you know, our era, uh, two prominent people who have made this kind of argument are E.F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, who comes sort of out of the social democratic tradition, the Labor Party tradition in Britain. And that's a book probably many of you have looked at. And then at the end, he's got some, uh, at the end of that book, he's got some 
uh, outlines of what uh, we mean by socialism and how it's relative, relevant to environmental sustainability. And then, of course, Murray Bookchin, who was more out of the anarchist tradition and uh, also envisioned a decentralized kind of uh, democratic socialism in the economy. Um, so those are sort of the broad ideas of what an ecological socialism would be in contrast to a capitalism which, oh, and I forgot the second form of extermination. There's the irrational exterminism when you issue out, you know, war and militarism. And then there's the very logical extermination that comes from an economy that grows without any sense of uh, limit or reciprocity with the environment until it consumes the environment that sustains it. And that's a form of exterminism that is uh, very logical, you know, systematic coming out of the system. So, then the question is, okay, how do we talk about socialism when the popular sense is like Buchanan, Matthews, and uh, O'Donnell on MSNBC, which, you know, that we can replicate many times when we listen to these kinds of discussions. And I think you don't begin to raise these issues by stamping socialism on your forehead and saying, we need socialism. Because, you know, the popular response is, well, you're just talking about a state bureaucracy, and what about my freedom, and, you know, all the things that are in the popular political culture. I think the way we begin to raise these things are with what's called a transitional program or a program of non-reformist reforms. Concrete popular demands that people think make sense on their own terms, like the right to health care. You know, single payer is socialized insurance. A, a health service like Britain has or Costa Rica has or Cuba has is a socialized, not just the uh, insurance, but the whole medical system with your medical uh, personnel delivering the services working uh, on a salary for the uh, for the system um, so and I think clean energy is another one where people are for it and and then what happens is you know the movement as they begin to fight for these things and find out they're not getting it and getting irrational answers from the best in interest that don't want it begin to see that these problems are systematic and it's not just a matter of persuading people, it's a matter of taking the power from these vested interests and democratizing the power so we can get what we really need. And then, so you start with common sense demands and as people get in the movement, they begin to see what's really going on and realize we gotta have systemic change. Um, what we did in this campaign that uh, Gloria was referring to is we kind of summed that up as the Green New Deal. And we felt, if we use the phrase New Deal, that, you know, for the, in New York especially, which had the tradition of the New Deal, we had a New Deal in New York before it went national with when Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins and the others went down to, and Francis Perkins to Washington. They were doing some of that in New York. And, and that's why people vote for the Democratic Party. They think they still stand for that when they obviously don't if you really look at it. Um, and what that means is we got to defend the parts of the old New Deal program which are worth defending, the social insurance, you know, the Social Security income, the Medicare, the Medicaid, those kinds of programs that uh, provide uh, social benefits. Another part of that program which never got fully implemented but was raised in the first Social Security Act, it was deleted so the bill could pass and then Roosevelt brought it back in his Economic Bill of Rights speech to Congress in 1944, State of the Union Address, the right to a job, they called that employment assurance, it would have generalized the Works Progress Administration so that Instead of going to unemployment offices, you go to employment offices and say, I want my job if you don't have a job in the private sector. And those jobs are planned locally and federally funded. Um, another part of the New Deal was public enterprise where private enterprise is failing. And they had in some of the jobs programs production for use and they were actually competing with the private sector. Now we do that through prisons, which is not where we want to go. Um, TVA, you know, where the private industry would not develop the electricity in Appalachia. Uh, the uh, Rural Electric Administration, which organized rural electric co-ops because the private IOUs, investor-owned utilities, would not string the wires out to these rural areas because it wasn't profitable or as profitable. So those are things. We defend the old New Deal, and then we want to take it further, green the New Deal. And that would mean ecology and democracy. You know, the democracy is something to counter the tendency toward bureaucratization where the bureaucrats take on an interest of their own. For, so for example, in the healthcare thing, um, we actually have three single payer bills in Congress. And the, most one, the one most people know is 676, which is a national health insurance plan. That goes right back to the New Deal. Then you got the 
one that Wellstone put in when he realized we might not get it nationally, but we should enable it for states. That's now the Sanders bill. And uh, then there's a third bill, which back in the early 70s, the debate was between a health service, uh, national health insurance, that was a Kennedy bill, the health service was the Dellums bill, and Nixon's bill, which is employer mandate, which is far to the left of what we got now with Obama. And the whole debate has shifted, so we didn't even talk about the health service. But it, it, I like that, and that's a bill that uh, Barbara Lee keeps introducing, and she has no co-sponsors. It's just sort of to keep the tradition alive. Um, but that was developed by the Medical Committee for Human Rights coming out of the Civil Rights Movement and wanted to democratize. They wanted a democratic model of administering health so that you would have community health boards elected two-thirds by the community, one-third by health care workers, and they would administer it, and then those boards would elect people to state boards and then a national board. So it was a bottom-up control of a health service that would be responsive to the people, not bureaucrats. And out of the 60s, we got a lot of proposals like that. Same thing for public power, which a lot of us have been working on to municipalize public power. And you would federate those at the state and then the national level and plan out the electric system and the gas and the energy system from below. Um, so that's what we mean by democracy, not just bureaucratic state programs, but democratically worker and community controlled programs and, and industries. And then the green investments. You know, I talked about the stagnation we've got now. We've built out a whole infrastructure. Instead of making tangible investment, new means of production that would employ people, they're speculating to rearrange who owns what we already have in terms of means of production. What we need now are green investments to get to a clean energy system, mass transportation, energy efficiency in our homes, and all the manufacturing and services that would support that building out that new infrastructure. I think that's how we can get the economy going now. And I think these are the kinds of demands that we have that are consistent with an ecological socialism and uh, can bring that back into discussion without trying to, you know, sort of beat it over, beat it into people with slogans, because I don't think that will work. So that is a very fast, uh, you know, toured through a bunch of propositions about both capitalism and ecological socialism. And I just wanted to throw them out there and, and have a discussion, which Gloria is going to referee or, or accelerate, as I hear Richard Grossman likes to say. The question is, under neoliberalism, the argument of the capitalists is we can't afford regulation, we can't afford investment in the social programs that we might want to restore. So how do we answer that argument? Well, the neoliberals are partly right. If they want to take profits, what they do, they've done is financialize because, as I said, there are no, not so many opportunities for tangible investment that generates profits. And to the extent it does, it's overseas. So we got trade agreements. Glass-Steagall removed a barrier to financialization when it was removed, as well as a whole lot of other deregulations of the financial sector. And so in a sense, you know, we have to say, you're right, you're not going to make profits but our argument is it has to be publicly directed to get into the things we need, which are those green investments. So while we defend, you know, regulations that make sense on their own terms and fund social programs that benefit people, we also say we need structural change. We need more public generation of investment. I mean, what I say is by taxing the rich and investing it in socially useful investments, we can make better use of the money than they are with their speculations, which are just rearranging who owns what. I think we don't want to counterpose what we can do locally in our municipalities to what needs to be done in a larger systematic scale. So there are things we can do to get more control of our local economy that are consistent with systematic change, like public power, like getting home rule on taxation. Say here in New York, you know, we got a property tax and a sales tax at the county level, but the state keeps the income tax, which is the most progressive tax. And we to have a more progressive system, we need to shift more of the taxation to income. Also, you know, we can reform the property tax to deal with site value rather than improvements, which discourages improvements. So there are a lot of things we can do there. And if we get uh, home rule on those things, we can begin to make some improvements without saying that's sufficient in and of itself. Um, I think sometimes people counterpose those and saying, oh, we can't change the system, but we can, you know, save our town. And that, I think, is naive. As you pointed out, we're too interconnected economically and environmentally. I would suggest everybody go uh, consult Michael Hudson, 
an economist who I kind of drew on here in saying that, you know, the, what the classical economists meant by a free market was a market free of unearned income, landlords and money lenders extracting surplus from the producing classes, which for most of them, except for Marx, were the industrialists, capitalists, as well as the workers. Um, and so I'm for a, a market to the extent. Another thing I think we have to realize is that um, the question of capitalism versus socialism is not planning versus market. You're going to have some mix. There were markets long before there was capitalism. As we socialize production and democratize the appropriation and distribution of surplus, there's still going to be a lot of it where you want market distribution. Um, and I won't go into a whole discussion. I think Michael Harrington and some of his books on socialism made a strong case for socializing and democratizing and planning investment, but allowing consumer goods to be priced by the market. And you get a more effective, efficient way of determining demand there. Um, and you can go beyond that to uh, some goods should be free. So we have free access to the roads, although with the neoliberals wanting us to privatize everything, they want to put toll booths everywhere and collect rent, for, you know, unearned income from us to use our social property. Yeah, I, I've read Corton. It hasn't been recently. And, you know, he has a lot of good partial reforms, but he wants to sort of wrap it in a way that's acceptable to people that buy the overall ideology that's pro-capitalist. And I think that's what I'm trying to raise here is we got to look at capitalism as a system and the problems it generates by its very structure and the problems beyond that because it creates irrationalities that take on their own illogic as is, is, uh, E.P. Thompson used to talk about in exterminism um, and, and begin to think about alternative systematic change. So, you know, I've, I've, I'm trying to remember some of the things Corton has proposed. I know it's financial regulation, maybe public banks, which is a way of democratizing investment. I think those are all good things, but um, I don't think we want to package it as a way of saving the system that is destroying us. I actually am, am coming on part of what Michael said, and, and it is a question to you too, Howie. And I'll be brief, Gloria, I promise. Um, for uh, most of us, when we're talking to people about becoming Greens or why the economics isn't working, a lot of the way we phrase it I don't think is effective. And, and this isn't a criticism of anything that's been said today, and the books that have been recommended and the folks everybody's read, sounds great. But when I'm at the grocery store talking to people, it's about the economic human rights, a right to a living wage, a living wage. If you're not having a living wage, that, isn't that slavery, if it's not a living wage? And one way to talk about it in terms of rolling things back, Michael, 20 years ago, it wasn't working for people then. It wasn't working for me. I'm 50 years old. I grew up low income, I'm still low income. So the concept that the economy's ever worked for everyone is false. Yes. So I think we begin by acknowledging that we haven't had an economy that's worked for everyone. Let's start by addressing the needs of the bottom 30% and then come up with options. And I think a lot of those options exist. But at the same time, let's create framing and messaging that speak to people in terms that resonate with their reality. And what do you think? <laughs> I think that's what I was trying to get at when I talked about a transitional program, concrete popular demands. Um, the other thing your comment makes me think of is an old distinction in the old left between education and propaganda. In other words, when you're going out to the public, you're doing these concrete popular demands, but within the movement, you're educating yourself so that people understand not just we want jobs, we want a living wage, we want health care, we want a clean environment, but internally we're figuring out, well, why don't we have it? Who's got the power? How do we get the power? How does the system work? And so that's why we have discussions like this at a Green Conference. But we don't go to the supermarket and start talking about capitalist exterminism and ecological socialism. Well, going back to court, and um, I, I wish I'd heard him say that last night about anti-capitalism. I know he's been anti-corporate, and he's been for smaller scale. Well, well, good. I, I probably need to catch up on my reading on him. Um, to say that, you know, this kind of uh, bottom-up administration of the economy never happened, I think, is not true. The Spanish Revolution had, you know, massive appropriation, expropriation by workers and peasants 
and they had a collectivized economy that operated pretty well for a year. Of course, they were fighting on the one hand, Franco's fascists, and on the other hand, the Popular Front, the communists were leading, saying it's not time for the revolution now, first we've got to beat Franco, and they fought the workers who had taken over things. So they were caught in a vice, but it wasn't an economic problem. Uh, the Russian Revolution, you know, as Hannah Arendt points out in covering all kinds of revolutions, when the old system breaks down and you have a popular revolution, people form uh, ways of administering the economy. You know, Chile, even when they elected Allende, he, 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 his slogan was, I have to make haste, we have to make haste slowly. Because on the one hand was Pinochet ready to bring down the hammer, on the other side was the popular movement that was forming neighborhood committees and workers' councils and pushing uh, democratization of the economy from below. So I think there's evidence that that can happen. And, you know, the limitation of, of working strictly bioregionally and locally is that you're still embedded in market networks and an environmental system that's bigger than just that locality. And so you've got to have a way of relating to other localities. And I think a, a bottom-up structure that that's indicative of is something that we should be thinking of. I mean, I think one of the things the anarchist wing of socialism <coughs> brought that the status wing didn't is the idea of federation from below. And uh, so I think that's part of that answer. Um, on the tragedy of the commons, one thing about that article is Garrett Hardin, who was a right winger, a eugenicist, uh, you know, pretty, pretty right wing guy, is he assumes private appropriation of the commons, because he has those, you know, I guess they're sheep farmers going in and they're all over grazing. Um, actually, commons were managed jointly by the sheep farmers to maintain sustainability, historically like in England, where, you know, Marx talks about the enclosure of the commons, which we're now seeing in Africa, you know, the Chinese and others are going in there and buying up farmland to grow crops, buying up resources, and the local people are being excluded from their land. And, uh, there, it's happening in other, India, you know, there's a whole guerrilla movement and right in the center of India, some of these people are still hunting with bows and arrows and they're fighting, you know, the Indian state, which ironically considers them a bigger threat than the Islamic uh, terrorists who are coming and blowing things up in Mumbai. Um, so that struggle is going, going. But I think the answer to that is the commons, which includes the environment, uh, is something, the way to do it is democratic, common management. Join, jobs or income now. That, that was uh, the Poor People's March slogan. I think that's what we got to talk about because not everybody can work. I mean, one of the things I wanted to point out on this was one of the debates when you talk about models is how much worker control, how much community control. And something that Gar Alperowitz, another guy worth reading on this, and Murray Bookchin also pointed out is that in any modern economy, only about 40% of the people are working. And the rest are children, disabled, elders, or people un involuntarily unemployed. So if you want something that's really democratic, you've got to have the final say by the community. And then the workers who are working respond to their demands for goods and services, um, and they manage their own, their own work. Um, and then work, there's a difference between wage slavery and work where you're producing for the common good and for your own satisfaction. I mean, that's where the disalienation that Marx talked about young, when he was young and William Morris who envisioned the kind of socialism where everybody was a craftsperson, you know, with a, with a skill and took pride in their work. You're a carpenter, right? You get pleasure out of, you know, good work. I even get pleasure out of unloading trucks right. I used to work in construction, but I didn't have a pension in, in health care. So, you know, any job, <coughs> Uh, you can take pride in. And I think people want to feel that they're uh, pulling their own weight in society. So I don't think, you know, demanding jobs is problematic. It is problematic if everybody's supposed to get a job when, you know, less than half the people are actually going to work even under a full employment economy. So I, I kind of like, you know, we need to have both, you know, income supports and, you know, the citizen's dividend idea that, you know, because there's so much social investment in creating, you know, is Teddy Roosevelt, of all people, said, you know, public investments in infrastructure are the public avenues of private commerce. I mean, everybody benefits from that, and they paid for it with their taxes. Therefore, they should have a right to the income that's generated by those common investments. I think that's a rationale we can make for the citizen's dividend or the guaranteed annual income. Now I sort of want to take the other side of the argument and say there's a lot we can do locally, a lot, a lot of times more than we think, in terms of... Uh, 
producing in, in the economy we have today. Uh, there's a very interesting book by Kirkpatrick Sale called Human Scale. And he systematically went through a lot of uh, the things that could be produced locally at economies of scale with current technology. And, and it's not in his book, but there's another guy who's a late economist, Steve Marglin, who pointed out that we have large factories not because it, you've, they're necessary for economies of scale, for efficient production, but in order to control labor. And uh, that the scales where you, you reach your efficiencies are much smaller than we thought. So Sale points out you could produce a lot of things locally and, and reach all the technological scales of efficiency. Um, Kropotkin had a book on fields, farms, and workshops, something like that, where he did that in an earlier technological stage that's uh, interesting. So I think by uh, either co-ops or municipal enterprises, we can begin to start producing a lot of things locally, economically, uh, in a way that you know, we can afford what we're producing and, and, and somewhat delink from global markets and these bad trade agreements and whatnot. We can't do it all because it is very interrelated, but I think we can do a lot more than we think. And those are things we can do when we talk about electing our people to uh, municipal office, which brings up Tony's or Tom's issue. I keep calling you Tony. Um, and that is, he's raising the question of power. You know, we make demands on power and we expect the people in power to implement them because it makes sense. And that gets into the problem of vested interests who have interests different than our own. And uh, so, you know, what, what's central to the transitional program, you raise these demands, you build a movement, but it's about getting the power to actually implement them. And the people in power are not going to. Now, you know, I think Egypt is an interesting example. They go into Rear Square, they make demands, they get rid of Mubarak, but the military regime is still there. There's still two million people that are being paid by the regime to spy on other people. Uh, the Brotherhood, which was sort of a tolerated opposition, is now being brought in as a junior partner, and the, and the more secular left youth and worker forces are being marginalized by that coalition. So th that is ongoing struggle, but I think, you know, what people are realizing is we don't just want to replace Mubarak with another military leader. We got to change the system and democratize it. Um, and I think people realize that in the course of struggling for, you know, they, they had simple demands, you know, some economic improvements and some political freedoms. And they're beginning to realize to get them, they got to get the power. And that the regime's got to be changed fundamentally, not just a few leaders at the top. Um, but going back to municipal level, we, we can start building local bases of power, which give us credibility, a record, and experience that we can then, you know, use as a platform for taking on bigger scales of power. Yes, uh, I love these conversations and how he does it better than most. And I think that we have, in the Green Party, people who explain this very well. But as a, as a young man watching an older man teach a young man how to kick a Harley motorcycle, and in those days, if you got it wrong, you could break your leg. And the young man said, you explain it very well. How do you do it? Well, in our hands today is the opportunity to do it. Because in a broken system, people will find the answer. People are finding the answer today. We're going to see in the next six months a farm movement of people, unemployed college students going back to the farm, which raises a lot of issues. We have the issue of prison labor. The people in the prisons are fighting and it would be who, those of us on the left, to join all of those movements to identify ourselves with the people who have the answers. We always say the people. The people do something and we step back. All over this country, the people are doing things and we step back, we theorize. The Green Party should be identified with every social and economic movement in the country that's going on today. We had community control, and the Green Party stepped back. We have to step into those movements, be identified with those movements, be a part of that, and therein lies the power to turn this economic corporate juggernaut around. Well, just two brief comments. Um, on the question of scale, we have to realize that capitalism is a centralizing system. It systematically centralizes control of the economy. So we got to deal with that as a system, even if we are advocating more local control, smaller scales of production and distribution. So I don't think we can avoid that. Um, 
And the Tea Party, you know, it's interesting. They, their argument is uh, don't confiscate the fruit of my labor in the form of taxes. And I think the left criticism is to the capitalists, don't confiscate the fruit of my labor in the form of exploitation. So, you know, I think the discussion we got to have with the Tea Party is, is who's really taking more of your money? You know, you, and if those, those numbers that I cited from those British economists is, are correct, half the time you spend at work, you're giving your money away before you pay any taxes. And, you know, I think that's something we can begin having some conversations about. Thank you.